All right, go ahead, Dominique. Okay, oh, am I muted still? No. Nope. I'm good now. Okay, well, hello, everybody. I can't really see your faces. This is, this is a new one for me. Uh, I'm going to be talking today briefly about SWD biology and then go into some management strategies that you guys can use moving forward. Oh, that doesn't work. There we go. I just got to click. Okay. So quick background, a uh, common name is Spotterwing Drosophila, but for the remainder of the presentation, I'm going to refer to them as SWD. Scientific name is Drosophila suzukii. It's an invasive species native to East Asia, first recorded in North America in 2008 in California, and then in Minnesota in August of 2012. Some quick key identify, identification tools you can use. The male has a spot in the tip of the wing just over the first vein. The female lacks this spot, so her key identifier is her serrated ovipositor, which is what really allows her to penetrate their preferred hosts for laying eggs such as healthy fruits. But other than that, they have a high reproductive rate, generation time anywhere between 7 and 14 days, and then their optimal development is between 18 and 28 degrees Celsius. Looking quickly at the life cycle, we'll start with the adults. The male and the female will mate. The female will then fly away to find her preferred host, such as a health, ripe fruit, health and ripe, healthy and ripe fruit, such as a raspberry or a strawberry. The eggs remain inside the fruit where they hatch, and then they undergo three larval instars. And this is the most damaging life stage of spotted wing drosophila. As they eat that flesh, they're kind of un, unbeknownst to the grower or the picker deflating the inside of that foot and making it mushy. After they've gone through these three larval instars, they'll pupate and emerge as adults. This is a nice little figure that I enjoy using to kind of look at the, some of the prefer, preferred hosts of spotted wing drosophila or SWD, kind of associated with risks. So on the far left, you see highest risks such as raspberries, strawberries, and cherries. In the middle, we have moderate risks such as grapes and apples. And really what's distinguishing these risks is the skin. So raspberries and strawberries are a nice soft skin, which make it very easy for the female's ovipositor to penetrate, where moderate risk, the skin is a little bit more thick and tough. And then finally, on the far right, we have alternate hosts, also known as non-crop hosts. And these can be found surrounding your crop or in a wood line. And in the absence of these other hosts, such as blueberries and raspberries and grapes, they will lay in elderberry and dogwood. So just to be aware of surrounding crops, kind of creating a refuge while your crop is growing or developing. So why are the growers concerned? Well, they have a high fecundity and a short generation time, meaning there can be a rapid increase in populations of upward, upwards of 15,000 flies per week can be produced. It's economically detrimental, as I'm sure you all know. Uh, in California, Oregon, and Washington, when it was first detected, there was over $500 million in revenue loss. In Minnesota, to bring it a little bit closer to home, an analysis was done in Minnesota, and it was determined that there was an annual loss of about $2.2 million in raspberries alone. So it's a very serious pest. A lot of growers are really curious what they can do to combat it, and that's where I'm going to kind of go from here is talk about some things that are still being tested and then some current recommendations that we have for you. So to begin, we have classical biocontrol. And they, when SWD was first found here in America, we went to their native range in South Korea and looked for biocontrol agents, which are, and these are two images of them. And they're, it's a beneficial insect that helps suppress the population of a pest species such as SWD. And unfortunately, these are not yet available in Minnesota, more specifically. Uh, by bringing these over, you have to do a lot of testing for effectiveness and safety, but there is biocontrol agents that could be a potential in the future. Next, we have cultural control, and we recommend sanitation. And for crops like strawberries and raspberries, where you have a succession of harvests, we recommend that as soon as you have ripe fruit in the crop to get out there and harvest them as soon as possible to really minimize the time SWD has to infest. And then also while you're collecting those healthy ripe fruits, also remove any rotting or other debris 
that may be uh, attractive to SWV because while they prefer healthy ripe fruits, they'll also find refuge in rotten fruit. So in the absence of a healthy ripe fruit, they'll continue reproducing in that rotten fruit until that healthy ripe fruit comes back. So just keeping your field clean of rotten fruit and any other debris they could refuge in. Next, we have varietal selection. And this is really specific to strawberries because we have strawberries that are June bearing and then fall. So those June bearing strawberries, the only thing that they really have that protects them from SWD is they become ripe typically before or just in the very beginning of the first detection of spotted wind drosophila being present in the field. So they can typically get those out of the field before press, pest pressure is super high where with the fall strawberries, they're typically ripe when pest pressure is high and they're super vulnerable. Next we have, what is this? I got a couple. Okay, I just wanna, I just wanna make sure I'm checking the chat here. I think we're... Don't worry about the chat, Dominique. Um, we'll take care of it after. Awesome, okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, so the next we'll move into chemical control, which is the use of insecticides. The, the pattern that I've kind of known and recommended kind of goes where you set up a monitoring system within your crop. At the first detection of SWD, you would get onto a weekly spray program. And one complication with the monitoring system can be proper identification. Because these flies are very, very small, if you don't have a microscope to properly identify them, you can have it can be very difficult to detect the first presence of the fly. So you can use resources like uh, Fruit Edge, which I'll have the website at the end of my slides for everyone to take a picture of, or other resources in the state that will give you pest alerts for when spotted wing or SWD is first detected. But that is the insecticide program really does recommend a weekly spray program because of their short generation time. Then a little bit more on insecticides, we have this table here that gives you some, some names that can be used for control of spotted wing drosophila. And before I go too much further, I would just like to mention that anything that I mention here gets kind of pushed to the side if you read the label and it's wrong. Always check the label of your insecticide before applying. Make sure you have the proper licensing and you're following regulations per the label. But on this table, you can see we have trade name, active ingredient. This middle section shows pre-harvest interval, which is something you should be very aware of, especially in crops such as strawberries, where you may be harvesting, harvesting numerous times. Make sure that whatever you're applying has a short enough pre-harvest interval when it comes to harvest time. And then finally, I'd like to bring your attention to the far right column, this class of insecticides. And this is important because, because you're spraying at such a frequent rate and they have such a short generation time, resistance can be built up very easily. So you wanna be sure to be rotating through those various classes to kind of slow down or minimize the chance of SWD developing resistance to any of these chemicals. And unfortunately for organic growers, there are very limited options, you really only have two. So. SWD is very complicated in an organic setting. So some more insecticide considerations are really just kind of reiterating some things I've said. Again, that resistance. It's very important that you follow regulations, that you're switching between the class of insects, insecticides, so we can minimize this chance of resistance building up quickly. And then next, the life cycle. So going back to that life cycle of SWD from the beginning, if you notice the majority of their life cycle is concealed within the fruit. So insecticide applications are really only targeting adults that happen to be present during spray application. Otherwise they're, they're protected within the fruit. So it's important to understand their biology and use that to the best of your advantage to try and target a time when adults are most active. And there's actually some preliminary data that was done in 2017 and 2018 where they set up traps at different time intervals. So on that x-axis we have 2017 and 2018 and then we have the two time intervals 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. and then 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. 
I know it's a lot of sex and it's hard, but basically what it is, it's overnight and during the day. And it shows the proportion trap catch on the y-axis. So in 2017 and 2018, that late evening to early morning time frame was when we caught the majority of the flies in the crop, kind of demonstrating that this could be their most active time of day, which is kind of poorly worded because it's typically nighttime. But um, so an early, an early morning or late evening spray would be have your best chance of targeting those adults because that's when they're gonna be most active in the crop. If you spray during the day, you could be wasting time and resources because they may not even be present and it's not shown that residual activity of the insecticides really suppresses the population. And then another kind of bonus to this strategy of doing late evening, early morning spray is I know in a lot of these berry crops, natural pollinators are present and then also honeybees, whether you're keeping honeybees or your neighbors are, uh, there's the concern of insecticide use with pollinators and by spraying early morning and late evening, you really are helping, of, you're minimizing the direct spray onto the pollinators. So not only is it a good time to spray for pest pressure, it also can help avoid directly spraying a lot of pollinators at once. Okay, and then next we have exclusion netting, which I think is starting to take a little bit more popularity in the berry industry. And basically all exclusion netting is, is, this image shows a miniature high tunnel. So the top of it is like a standard polyplastic, and then the exclusion netting is placed on both ends of that high tunnel. And all it's doing is creating a physical barrier between the crop and the insect that it's not impregnated with insecticides or anything, it's just an 80 gram mesh netting that's sealed up tightly to prevent access. And in 2016 and then repeated in 2017, there was some work done with exclusion netting and I'm gonna share that with you to kind of show the effectiveness of it. So the treatments for this study, we had standard poly with a trap, and standard poly, when I say that refers to, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but these high tunnels here, the plastic on the top, and then the netting closed off on the ends. So we had one of those, or we had a treatment of those with traps in them, a treatment with no trap in them, the standard poly with artificial infestations, and this was to mimic what would happen if an accidental introduction occurred. And then finally, an open plot to mimic a typical open raspberry field and how that compares to our standard poly treatments. So there's a lot going on here, but I'm gonna to try to break it down the best I can for everybody. This is data that's demonstrating the trap catches in the open plot and the netted plots of the treatments. So on the left side, we have the open plot and you can see the trap catch started about mid to late June, which is a fairly typical first trap catch of SWD. And then for the remainder of the season, you see a consistent presence of the flat or SWD. We move over to this, the figure on the right side, and you can see that on the x-axis, sorry, I jumped ahead. We have the dates, and then the y-axis is the number of flies per trap per week. But again, that first trap catch occurred around mid to late June. The dotted line repre represents when we put that plastic over the top of the tunnel or over the top of the raspberries. And then the solid line represents we put that exclusion netting on the ends. And you can see up until the exclusion netting, the population is similar, or the trap catch is similar to that of the open plot. But once we put on that netting, the trap catch drops and remains near zero for the rest of the season. So it gives insight into the exclusion netting, was able to successfully exclude the fly from accessing the crop. And then again in 2017, I won't bore you with explaining it again, but it's a similar scenario. In the open plot, we see a consistent presence of SWD, but once we move over to this figure on the right side, once you add that netting, the population drops and remains zero for the rest of the season. And while this is great, the netting is excluding and stopping the fly from accessing the crop, I think what you probably care about more as a grower is infestation level. So they took this, they took their data collection one step further and they also looked into infestation, percent infestation in the berries. So in this table, we have the two years, 
2016 and 2017, and then either three or four separate harvest dates in raspberries. On the far left, we have the different treatments. So if we look at the standard poly with and without the trap, majority of the time you have about a 0% infestation, meaning that there was no larvae found in the berries that were sampled. The highest it got to is about a 7% infestation. However, when we go to this very bottom row, this open plot with the trap, we get, is, we get over 97% berry infestation. So about a 90% decrease when you add, in a worst case scenario for this study, when you add that exclusion netting to it. So this demonstrates that not only does it stop the flies from getting to the crop, but it also is minimizing that infestation. There's not something going on outside of the trap you're not seeing. And then with that artificial infestation, there is, there is some infestation that occurs within the berries, but again, compared to just an open plot with no treatment whatsoever, it's, it's a very small amount. And then this definitely went quicker than I thought. I'm sorry if I talked really fast, um, but in conclusion, First, I'd like to mention if you want to take a picture of this in the bottom left corner, that's the Fruit Edge website I mentioned earlier. This kind of can give you updates on the various things that we're doing at the U of M with Spot Ranger software, Japanese Beetle, and all that. But yeah, in conclusion, SWD is a complicated pest. It's very small, reproduces very quickly, and it's a pest that's been here since 2012, but we're learning new things every day about it. And we'll continue to keep you updated as we can. Hey. And, yeah, thank everybody. No, I'm good. Thank everybody. Uh, we're just going to go to Christelle, I'm pretty sure, though, right? Yep. Uh, so that was, that was awesome. I feel like you presented a lot of information really concisely, um, and it was really clear. So I'll stop. Um, I think since you presented that insecticide table, and that's something where people might want to just be able to look at that and kind of study it. Uh, so this might be one where we should try to get our slides in PDF and send them out to everybody. Would you guys be comfortable with that if we yeah. do that? Sure. Usually we just send the recordings, but I feel like in this presentation today, there's a lot of different pesticide tables. So we should probably give them the PDF. So um, we'll send that out to over email to everybody when we send out the recording. There was one question that, I think it was just one question that came up during the presentation. Um, There's two. Two, okay. Um, Christelle, you actually answered those. So I guess either of you could comment. Well, the Aronia one, if you want, Dominique, I can answer that because we actually did research on Aronia. Okay. So if you're okay with that, I'll just take that one. Um, so we did a study on Aronia because we had uh, a grower here in um, near Madison that had an issue with spotted wing in their Aronia. And they knew spotted wing, that was years ago, um, from their raspberries and their, um, they just asked us, what, what do we know about Aronia? And there was nothing. And so what we did is we conducted those lab assays, the no choice lab assays, just to see if the flies were actually able to penetrate the skin of the uh, Aronias. And so we put them with um, fruit that wasn't cut and fruit where the skin was cut. And when the skin of Aronia is not cut, the flies are not able at all to penetrate the fruit. So it is not the fact that um, the, the serrated ovipositor is able to cut the skin of the fruit. What we found is that as soon as the fruit is picked, because you remove the pedestal, that's when they get infested. And so um, for Aronia, really, it's trying to minimize the amount of exposure that the flies are going to have after harvest or if there's any cracking that happens. But they are not able to cut the skin of the fruit from all the lab assays we've conducted. What we also found from that study, which was interesting, is that the flies that did emerge from cracked uh, Aronia fruit were much smaller than the flies that came out of raspberries. So it's actually a suboptimal host for them. Um, they don't develop as big as they would on a raspberry. We didn't look at fecundity, but at least they were smaller. So um, just wanted to address that because we've done it. Um, yeah, Carindale is actually the farm, Roberta, that we asked us to, uh, to address that. And we did the study with their, um, their aronia. And so we found that it was actually in the pack packing line when they are harvesting, the growers are harvesting, 
and then going through the process of cleaning and packing and all of that. That's when we did the different steps in the process. I don't think we put that in our paper. Maybe we did. And that's when the actual um, flies were able to get in. And then the other question was about lanate. And I think I answered that, but I don't think it's registered on raspberries, but it's good on blueberry. So. And then um, I think we have to move on to your next uh, topic, Christelle. Um, so there were a couple more questions and we are gonna get to those questions at the end. Um, maybe just while you're transitioning, Dominique could tackle one of these questions. We got SWD in our netted hoop house. Are they going to winter over? Um, with the overwintering, I, I don't, I, unfortunately, I don't know if you know anything more about that, but there hasn't really been a confirmed overwintering of SWD in hoop houses. If you have a crop in there all season long that they can live in potentially, but there is still, um, there's still a lot of mystery behind what SWD is doing over the winter, during the winter time. Okay. What I would add to that is that we know they have a winter as adults. So if they have a protected area, it's very possible that they could have a winter, but we don't have, like Dominique said, any way of uh, showing that. It's been really hard research to do yeah. with the overwintering stages, but it's the adults that overwinter. So if they survive, which is likely going to be less than 1%, then yes, they might be in your hoop house after. But if the question is, should we spray something? No. <laughs> okay. All right, so um, if that's okay, I'll transition about managing Japanese beetle and berry crops. So again, I'm Christelle Gedo. I'm the food crop entomologist and extension specialist at the UW-Madison. And um, I'll just show you here a quick life cycle for Japanese beetle. I'm sure you've all seen Japanese beetle. Um, they're present everywhere uh, pretty much now in Wisconsin as well as uh, Minnesota, at least on the uh, west side of Minnesota. Um, what you have here is really a one generation per year life cycle. They will emerge, um, usually it's on Father's Day, um, at least in Wisconsin, and they're emerging all the way through August. They can lay multiple times, mate multiple times. You've seen them all mating. That's what all they seem to do is mate and feed. Um, they lay about 40 to 60 eggs. They live for about the summer, 30 to 45 days. And so they will lay their eggs about 10 centimeter deep in small batches under the soil. The eggs will hatch and the larvae will climb back up a little bit and they feed on the roots of the grasses, the turf grass that you have. Um, in berry crops, everywhere I've gone, that's what people have in their alleyways and around their berry crops. It's the same in vineyards, it's the same in a lot of different uh, cropping system, even orchards, and that's what they like to feed on. And that's important because that's where the female will go and lay their eggs, because the larvae are not very mobile, so they're gonna stay where the eggs are laid. They just go up a little bit, feed on the roots of the grass, and then they burr down uh, 10 to 15 centimeters deep, and so as you can imagine, with a snow cover on top of that, they're pretty well protected from the very cold temperatures and the polar vortex and all those kind of things that um, tend to not go that deep into the soil. Um, so that's just to show you, this is research we've done in vineyards, um, but just to show you kind of that seasonal phenology. And really it's consistent that about uh, Father's Day until the third week of September, is how long we see them, at least in all of southern Wisconsin. We went east to west, uh, pretty much. And this was at 20 vineyards. So that's about the phenology we get. We get this kind of peak early on, which I think this year has been more typical of what you see for 2018, where we had a very high emergence, a lot of beetles, and we kind of dipped ever since. And I don't know if that's what people have been experiencing, but it's been like that around here in, in Dane County. Um, so we know that they like the sunlight, but I just wanted to um, tell people that really when there's research that's been done years ago uh, by a very prominent scientist, um, um, Potter, in, um, on Japanese beetle, what they found in linden trees, where that's a very preferred host, 80% of them are in the shade by the late morning. So don't count on just looking in the sunny areas. You'll see the next slide I have where this is what we typically recommend, but a lot of them are in the shade. So don't count that they're all in the sun. 
the feeding occurs from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. That's the peak. And I was questioning that what they were doing at night and they're still hanging out on those plants and they might still be feeding on those plants even at night. So something also to think about. And then this is a, um, um, where they lay their eggs. And this is from work done in turf grasses uh, where people are looking at golf courses and places like that, where they prefer to lay their eggs is in areas that have moist, loamy soil that's covered with turf and in lower cuts, so less than one and a half inch long of the turf. That's what they prefer. And they also go into mulched plant beds. So again, this is the slide I mentioned that this is kind of the recommendation that you usually hear for scouting the beetles are easy to see, but again, don't think that they're just in that sunny areas. They're on the upper canopies for sure. But the 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., you're going to have them throughout that time when it's sunny out there. So look in the shade as well. And just make sure that you pay attention. The monitoring trap, we know they're very effective. We also know that they attract a lot of beetles that might not have come to your host plant. So they could be used from an early warning standpoint, if you want to know like around Father's Day, when exactly are they showing up, but remove those traps if you use them and the recommendation is don't use them at all. So just making sure that everybody is, um, is aware of that. Monitoring for larvae is something in blueberries, for example, that uh, people have done. And so what you can do in this case is you sample the soil for the larvae in and around your infested field. Um, because I'll talk about that later, you can apply a soil treatment. Uh, and I'll talk about that at, at some point in what the best timing for that. Um, you can take samples in those grassy areas. In the spring, that will be the best time because in the summer, you don't have a larvae. You have those larvae that are, have emerged as adults and then you have um, eggs at the beginning and the very small larvae are very high, hard to see. You can cu cut a one square foot of soil and shake through the soil and look for grubs in the root system. Um, this is how you would identify a grub for Japanese beetle. This is this V pattern here on the raster of the larvae. It's hard to see, but it's pretty much by the size of those grubs. There's a lot of grubs out there. They all assume that C-shaped position, but the size can help you determine, um, and I can't tell you in inches how big it is, but it's, it's smaller than a dime uh, when it's rolled up like this but there's no action threshold. So it's gonna be kind of a, a comfort level. If you see a lot of them, if you see you do one square foot and you start seeing at least one, two, three, ten in your grassy, uh, your square foot of soil, that's a problem. Um, if you see one here, one there, but you don't see a lot, then I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't do a soil um, treatment. From a standpoint of an economic threshold for Japanese beetle adult feeding in fruit crops, we don't have any. So what we use is what we have from a study uh, done in, at Michigan State from grapes. And what they did in this study is they punctured the grape leaves. And this shows you with a, a hole puncher for pa paper. They did the equivalent of 10%, 20%, 30%. And as you can see, 30% defoliation, they stayed between the veins, just like the skeletonization of a Japanese beetle is quite a lot of defoliation and that's only represent, that only represents 30%, okay? So that's the threshold that we're using in grape. From that study, that's when after the 30%, they started seeing, or at 30%, started seeing an impact on um, the plant growth for the next year. So that's what I would recommend. It's um, tolerating quite a bit of defoliation. Um, but that's, that can help you in, in determining that you don't need to spray if you're seeing something like this. Um, it's a comfort level, so it's hard to really get to that because of the cosmetic appearance of things. Um, there was also this study here that they conducted at Michigan State. And what they did on these young grapevines is they caged 0, 20, 10, or 40 Japanese beetle in those, um, on those plants. And after... Um, two weeks of having those um, beetles in there with the 40 Japanese beetle for two weeks on those young vines, they end up with less than 70% defoliation, which is quite amazing to realize that that really 40 beetles on a young plant for two weeks only cause that much. So you can imagine that we can actually tolerate a lot more than we think 
And I think that's kind of the bottom line that I want to come up with here. We conducted a study in, in grape to show uh, where the Japanese beetle are located throughout the vineyards. And what we found is that there, um, when you look at the edge, the midpoint between the edge and the center of a, a vineyard block and the center, there is more adults at the edge of the, of the vineyard than there are at the midpoint or the center. And um, the larvae, which is the other graph here, were actually found throughout the vineyard. So there was no difference between the edge, the midpoint, or the center. And the numbers were pretty low if you see uh, about three. You can remember we had two different measurements um, as far as density, but uh, it's core, soil cores. So I, I can't give you the exact number here, uh, density value, but it was a low number of larvae. And they were similarly um, present throughout the vineyard. And of course, the more adults we have, the more damage we have at the edges, which is something to think about when you're looking at uh, applying an insecticide, is really looking at the edges um, first, um, where you could target those insecticide applications as opposed to a, um, a prophylactic application. There were some studies in Michigan done in blueberries. Um, and in this case, what they looked at is tillage versus just a ryegrass in the row middle of those uh, blueberry plants. And they had fewer larvae in the tilled um, areas uh, compared to the uh, um, ryegrass. There was 72% lower larval density in tilled fields compared to those uh, grassy row middles. And also they looked at fewer adults in the field perimeters um, in the tilled versus the grassy fields. But when they looked at the center of those fields, that uh, the fewer adults kind of washed out. There was no difference uh, between the uh, tilled and the grassy fields. But at the uh, perimeter, it did have an impact where there were fewer adults in the tilled versus the grassy fields. So tillage in the spring caused a 51% and in the fall, a 70% reduction in larval density. Um, they're suggesting that removing grass during the egg-laying period, which is July to sep through September, is particularly important. And another approach that they suggested is to cultivate the fields after harvest to disturb the larvae and reducing the food for larval development. But that would be for a, cult a cultural control method from a standpoint of the larvae. Unfortunately, not a lot of people are using tillage because from a standpoint of a a farm management that's not so recommended anymore. Um, but they also looked at cover crops and here they had uh, four different treatments. They had a bare ground, uh, they planted buckwheat, clover or ryegrass. And in this case, this is the Japanese beetle um, adults. And what they had is a, a difference in uh, the different treatments where they had more uh, larvae, more adults, I'm sorry, on the buckwheat compared to the other treatments. And clover ryegrass were similar, and then they had even less on the bare ground. So buckwheat was more preferred by the adults and the bare ground less preferred. But then when we look at the larvae, it kind of changes a little bit. And they had more larvae when we look at uh, the, the places where we have the ryegrass, as we know that's a preferred host. And then we had um, the least number of larvae was in the buckwheat and the bare ground. So that kind of flips around between the larvae and the adults, which makes sense because they don't look for the same things. So remember I mentioned from turf grass that um, they like to lay eggs in turf that's at the lower uh, cut, less than one and a half inch. So the recommendation in turf grass is to number one, withhold irrigation during the adult activity. We mentioned that that's July all the way through um, September. So try to not water too much because they like that moist soil. Raise the cutting height of the grass within those, um, those areas. If you have in the row middles and around your, your patch a lot of grass, raise the cutting height. Go more than three inches. That, less, that is less um, um, attractive to the females to lay their eggs in. And then you can irrigate your turf um, in mid-August and September to help the turf recover. So you could do that later in the season of the adult activity. 
Here you have insecticides uh, for controlling, and this goes back to the question we had for spotted wing. Because this is for berry growers, and we're talking to uh, potentially blueberry growers and strawberry growers and potentially uh, raspberry growers, please make sure you check those labels because not everything is registered for all the different crops. Um, but you have different um, insecticides that you can apply. I also always put some that are organically approved and you have um, Nemix. And the idea of Nemix is really that as a directin, that's the active ingredient, this is good efficacy uh, for Japanese beetle. It has a zero PHI. Um, any product that has as a direct in, as a direct and uh, other names I can think of right now, as long as they have that active ingredient will work um, pretty well in um, organic production. We also have Pyganic and Surround. Uh, Surround is a kale in clay. Um, those are also uh, pretty good in organic production. Nothing is excellent. That's the same thing for spotted wing. Pyganic, for example, is also one that works okay for spotted wing, but nothing is excellent. What you will have rated as excellent for efficacy are going to be your pyrethroids for Japanese beetle, your carbamate, and that's really what you're going to have. Um, and this is talking about the adult management here. The chemical control for the larvae is really the idea is to decrease the populations in and around those infested fields. And so the idea is to do that as a preventative insecticide application. And in this case, it would be a neonicotinoid, whether it's imidacloprid, cotinidin, tiamethoxam. And that would be done before July. So you have to do that as the adults are emerging, they're starting to lay those eggs and you want those residues when you apply them to be there when those eggs will hatch and those young larvae are present. So that window is really, if you wanna do that, at the end of June is when you wanna do it. Um, once you're mid-July, those larvae are gonna start being, some are gonna start being uh, bigger larvae and it's not gonna work as well. There's a long residual activity, but the best time would be end of June when they're barely starting to emerge and as they are starting to lay those eggs. You wanna water the compounds in after you apply. Um, what people have found, that's from Michigan State, is if you apply Admire Pro late in June, in those grassy field perimeters, uh, you'll decrease the number of Japanese beetle adults for two weeks uh, on your bushes, but then more fly in. So it's kind of a short-lived um, impact that you have, but could be used as a part of an IPM program. And that's what I have. Wonderful, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen now. If you have any questions, feel free to type those in. Um, that was a lot of really good information about Japanese beetles too. Uh, it's always interesting to me to hear about the thresholds and what actually uh, might look really bad is only 10%. Um, <laughs> you know, it's hard to get used to that. So I'm slides, okay. So I'm gonna to try to do this in 10 minutes. I'm gonna talk briefly, like kind of just talk about what's the to-do list for what to do at this point in the season and looking forward into the fall for strawberries and blueberries uh, to get those ready for the winter. So this is basically a chart uh, that shows the different tasks for strawberries in production years that you do throughout the months of the strawberry season. Uh, from January to December. So what we're going to be focusing on today is everything within this uh, kind of red rectangle here from mid-August until the end of December. So uh, one of the things we think about at this point is nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, not too much time left to, to do that, but there are still a few weeks here. Soil testing, uh, what to do about runners, irrigation, putting on straw, and weed control. So there's still all these things to think about until the end of the season. And for blueberries, we're gonna talk about those as well. I know in the, the agenda that was posted online, we didn't uh, list blueberries, but I did wanna touch on these today. So for blueberries, soil testing, if you haven't done that in a few years, foliar testing between late July and August, phosphorus and potassium soil fertilizer, if needed, this is a good time to get that in. 
pH amendment if needed based on the soil test and perennial weed control. So these are all things we're gonna to touch on in the next few minutes. All right, so as I said before, this is a good time to be applying the last, uh, the last bit of nitrogen for the season that you're gonna be putting on strawberries. So um, we're already at this point, we're past renovation. I'm not gonna be talking about renovation today uh, because that was a couple weeks ago at least, but we did put out an article in the U of M Fruit and Vegetable News a couple weeks ago about renovation. So you can find that there in our newsletter. Um, but other than what you put on at renovation, we do still recommend putting on about another 30 pounds per acre of nitrogen in mid to late August. Whether it's a new or an established planting, that recommendation is the same. Um, at this point in the season, phosphorus and potassium are not necessary unless the soil test or the foliar test indicate that. Um, if, if we're putting on excess nutrients to strawberries, it can actually uh, cause unintended consequences. And so we don't wanna be putting on a bunch of stuff unless we know we need it and there's a purpose for it. Um, so foliar testing and soil testing are gonna be important in determining if you need to spend money on phosphorus and potassium at this point in the season. But if you do, this is a good time to put that on because it takes a while for those nutrients to mobilize themselves in the soil. And so you want those to be available by the time the spring comes along. The nitrogen recommendations at this point in the season can be a little bit different depending on what your organic matter level is. So if you have uh, a really low organic matter with a lot of sand, you're gonna be looking at a total throughout the year of about 80 uh, pounds per acre of nitrogen. And as your soil organic matter goes up, uh, that nitrogen goes down because it's able to stay in the soil. The soil can hold on to it better. But again, uh, about 30 pounds of that can happen at this point in the season. Um, I did get a, a question from a couple of people over email about should you do all that nitrogen at once or should you split it? And I would say that if you have a sandier soil, it's a good idea to split that into two applications maybe one now and one two weeks from now, I wouldn't go any later than the first week of September because those plants really need a chance to harden off for the winter. And if they're getting too much nitrogen too late, that actually makes it harder for them to harden off because they think they still need to keep growing. Um, so I wouldn't go too late, but if you have a sandy soil, splitting it up, we'll make sure that if we get a heavy rain, like we're getting in my area today, that all that nitrogen you put in just doesn't completely run off the field. Um, so splitting it up can help you actually save, uh, save some wasted fertilizer that way. So soil testing, it doesn't have to be done this time of year. It can also be done in the spring or during renovation. Um, you don't necessarily need to do it if, unless it wasn't done before planting uh, or if you're trying to diagnose problems. We do recommend a soil test every time you plant a new strawberry patch. Foliar testing though, this is a really good time of year to do that. And this photo on the right, um, this is Marvin Pritz at Cornell. That's a snapshot from a video that's really helpful in learning how to do foliar testing on um, blueberries, strawberries, and raspberries. So the link is here, and I'll actually, uh, after my presentation, I'll try to share this link in the chat box, but um, Marvin demonstrates how to do a foliar test or a foliar sample for strawberries. And so this is the type of leaf you collect. You want all three uh, petals when you collect that leaf, and then uh, you need to collect about 50 of these for one sample. And so you want to collect, if you have like a problematic part of your field, collect a sample for that part of your field and then for the healthier part of your field so that you can diagnose what the issue is in the problematic area. And so if your foliar test comes back and says that you're deficient in phosphorus and potassium, you still have a chance to do that this fall uh, before we go dormant for the winter. These tables, which again, this is a reason I wanted to um, send the PDF of the presentations to everybody because you're not gonna memorize uh, these tables, but just know that there are recommendations out there based on what your soil tests are, uh, and looking at the soil test, how much uh, potassium and phosphorus you should be applying. Runners, that was another question that uh, I received over email. So. A few things to know about runners when deciding what to do about them at this point in the year. Know that next year's flower buds are formed in the late summer and the fall. So anything that we do after renovation, that's stimulating those, uh, those flower buds and determining how many there are going to be. And the earliest runners that come up right after renovation, 
those are always going to be the most productive the next season. So it's especially important to renovate as soon as you can after the season's over. Don't delay that because the sooner you can renovate, uh, the healthier and more productive, the more flower buds you're going to have. Um, so that's the first thing that you can do to support stronger runners and more flower buds for the next year is earlier renovation. The second thing is removing runners um, between the rows in the fall. If you have a lot of runners forming in the straw between the rows, those are stealing energy from the plants in the row and the daughter plants that are trying to grow in the row. Um, so if you can remove those runners between the rows with tillage, or if you can use a cultivator to try to push those runners into the row, that will help fill out those rows and create more flower buds for you. Irrigating weekly is extremely important. I'm not sure how many growers in Minnesota are continuing to irrigate after the season is over, but keep in mind that what we do after renovation d directly correlates to the crop load for next year. So just because there aren't any berries growing, it's still very important to irrigate weekly and make sure your plants are getting at least, you know, one, one and a half inches per week. And then weed control, of course, is very important to minimize competition. Applying straw. Um, I recently learned that there actually are some growers in Minnesota who aren't applying straw to their berries. Um, it concerns me a bit because straw can be so incredibly important for protecting our berries and helping them over winter. Um, so anything, any temperatures below 12 degrees Fahrenheit do cause crown damage. Um, so if, if you're not using straw and you're seeing that your leaves are small, your plants are small, your fruit are small, that could be one issue, a major issue. Um, straw also prevents the freeze-thaw events that can happen during the winter and they prevent desiccation as well from December uh, until the end of April or beginning of, uh, of May when we remove that straw, beginning of April, I meant. Um, so straw should be applied. Uh, one rule of thumb is after three consecutive days with soil temperatures um, that are below 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's one rule of thumb that you can use. There's another rule of thumb that's called the plywood test. Uh, take a piece of, uh, of heavy, wide plywood put it over a few plants within the field. Once the temperatures outside are getting to about the low 20s, you're trying to figure out if the plants are dormant and if they're dormant, it's time to put the straw on. So put that plywood down after a couple of days, lift it up. If the plants under the plywood are green, that means they've gone dormant and it's time to put the straw on. If they're yellow under that, that means that they're not dormant yet and you need to still wait a few days. There's a couple rules of thumb you can use to figure out when to put on straw. Um, of course, it's gonna depend on location, but typically it's sometime in November. Um, you need the straw to be two to four inches deep after it settles, and so that's gonna translate to about two and a half to three tons per acre if you're using a straw mulch. You can also use chopped corn stalks, and you need about twice as much um, weight for if you're gonna be using the chopped corn stalks rather than the straw. Um, so, Herbicide carryover in straw is definitely something to be very aware of when you're sourcing your straw. Uh, only certain herbicides can cause issues, but uh, these are herbicides that are commonly used. So some of them are uh, Milestone and Stinger, if those are used in pastures, and then Grazon is another one because strawberries are very sensitive to these two active ingredients listed here. And so those can really carry over in the straw and those can take a very long time to break down. Um, they can take anywhere from 30 days to several years to break down depending on the weather conditions, especially if they're put in a compost or manure and then you're applying those onto your strawberries. That's something to think about as well uh, because they actually break down even slower in a compost or a manure pile. But if you're using them just as fresh straw, you also need to think about that. Um, you especially don't wanna be applying something with that herbicide residue in it within 30 days of it being harvested. Um, glyphosate in straw is less of a concern because it breaks down so rapidly, but always, always, always read the labels of the products that were applied to the straw um, so that you could be informed about what those carryover times might be. And so this is a really good article that I found that goes through this and compares different products and um, their carryover rates in straw. All right, the next thing I wanted to talk about was weed control post renovation to November. So if you're an organic grower, or even if you're not an organic grower, we all know that there's a lot of hand weeding that goes on in strawberries. Um, so this is something to do regularly with light cultivation between the rows, 
Um, you can also use flame weeding, and there has been research actually on using feeder yeast uh, for weed control in strawberries. They found that if you limit the range that the feeder geese can, uh, can move around, sometimes they even actually go after flat grass roots as rhizomes. Um, herbicide application, one timing is the end of renovation, so using a post and pre-emergent then can make a huge difference for knocking out a lot of the weeds in the fall, so you don't have to worry about that so much. But the other time point is end of October and into November, right as those plants are going dormant to kill um, those winter annual weeds that are just starting to come up and then keep that pre-emergent activity from that herbicide into the spring to keep weeds down in the spring. Uh, but be careful not to apply it too late because those shouldn't be applied to frozen ground. So listed here, again, we will uh, make this available, but this, these are a few of the options to consider for fall herbicide that can actually be applied over the plants. If you're just thinking about something that you're gonna spot spray or something in between the rows, there are plenty of options for that. All these options are listed in the Midwest Fruit Pest Management Guide from about pages 160 to 165, depending on what edition you have. But these, the ones I listed here are specifically options to address questions I was getting about what you can actually apply over the plants in the fall. And you'll note that a lot of these need to be applied late in the fall once the plants are going dormant. Um, and so this is a good resource, this link here, uh, that compares these products and talks specifically about what can be applied to plants that were just planted in, the, in that year as well. All right, a couple more minutes, blueberries. Things to do this year, soil testing, foliar testing, phosphorus and potassium if needed. This is a good time of year to do that. pH amendment if needed. It's a good idea to do that in the fall so that uh, if you're applying sulfur, it has time to actually um, convert the soil pH before the spring. It takes a while to do that. And then perennial weed control as well. This is a good time to do that as well. So um, this is another uh, screenshot from that video with Marvin at Cornell, he's showing how to sample leaves from blueberry bushes. And what he's showing here is that when you sample leaves for a foliar test for blueberries, we wanna take mature leaves that are fully formed, but not super old mature leaves. And so he's showing that you don't wanna take leaves just from the very tip of the shoot, and you also don't wanna take them from too far down. So right there in the middle, when they're fully expanded, those are the leaves that you want. So if you have a problematic part of your field, same as with strawberries, take a separate sample for the problem area of the field, and then a separate one for the normal or good producing part of the field so that you can compare those to each other and try to diagnose what the problem is. And um, so, yeah, early to mid-August is the ideal time to do your foliar sample before those plants start to senesce for the fall. Soil sample you can take any time. Um, putting on soil nutrients. So definitely want to mention this. Uh, I don't know how common a mistake this is, but we don't recommend putting on nitrogen in the fall. Uh, most recommendations say to stop putting on nitrogen once the harvest season has started. A uh, big reason for that is if we're putting on nitrogen on blueberries late in the season like this, it starts forming additional uh, shoot growth and leaves on those blueberry plants when they actually need to be translocating their nutrients back down to the roots and senescing for the winter. So that can actually really influence their winter hardiness. So we do not recommend putting nitrogen on at this point, but you can put other, nitro or other nutrients on depending on your foliar and your soil test. pH amendment for blueberries. Um, the biggest thing I want everybody to look at is these numbers right here. If you're gonna be putting sulfur on based on your soil test, um, these are some key numbers. If let's say you have sandy loam soil, how much sulfur per acre do you need to decrease that pH by one unit, say from 5.7 to 4.7? And that would be 600 pounds per acre. Typically with these large amounts, let's say your pH is 6.1 on your mature blueberries. It kind of, it kept creeping up and you really want to get it back down. I wouldn't put all that down at once with those large quantities. I would split that into at least two applications, if not three. Perennial weed control. This is a good time to do that in blueberries. Well, maybe not yet, but in a few weeks, rather. If you're thinking about weeds like thistles, creeping charlie, and quackgrass. So with perennial weeds, what happens is, just like with perennial fruit plants, at the end of the season, they're translocating all their carbon, sugars, water down from the foliage into the roots. If you spray those weeds with a broadleaf herbicide at this point in time, those herbicides are also going to be translocated down into the roots. And so it does a better job 
of killing those perennial weeds if they're applied late in the season in the fall. And so um, in a few weeks here is going to be a really good time to do that. And again, herbicide options for blueberries are also available in the Midwest Fruit Pest Management Guide. Okay, so that was very quick, but I wanted to make sure we still had time for questions. So. This was great, Annie, thank you. Sure. There is a question for you in the Q&A. Can you use chopped leaves in place of straw? I think those chopped leaves are gonna break up a lot quicker than you want them to. So I, I can't recommend uh, using chopped leaves in place of straw, but there are some very experienced berry growers on here uh, who might also be able to type in the chat if they have tried that and had experience with it. There was a, another question, if you were done, sorry. There was another question in the chat from Kevin Edberg about does U of M offer berry crop leaf analysis or do they need to find a private lab? Yeah, so U of M does actually offer foliar analysis for farmers. Um, that was not made clear until a couple of years ago that you actually can submit them to U of M. Um, if you go on soiltests.cfans.umn.edu, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can share this link and a few others. Uh, there's actually the form that you need to submit is on the front page. And it's called the Diagnostic Plant Form. I'm going to reshare my screen now so that I can show you where I am on that website. OK, so open up the internet. So I'm at soiltest.cfans.umn.edu. And even though it says soil testing lab, you can submit foliar samples here. So on the, on the main page, just scroll down. And this is the link we want right here, this Diagnostic Plant. If you click on that, it downloads the form that you have to submit. So this is the form here. Um, and when you submit a test, I usually recommend for berry growers to uh, submit it for this multi-element spectroscopy plus total nitrogen. So it's going to be $50 per sample. If you're thinking about trying to be more precise about your fertilizer regimen, having $50 is probably going to save you a lot of money making sure that you're not applying things that you don't need to be applying. Um, so I think it's a pretty good deal. And then uh, here it, it asks you the staff number analyzed or authorizing the analysis. You can just put my name down there if you're in Minnesota. So yeah. I think one question um, and Dominique answered that as far as the westward expansion, I was going to share my screen and just show you. So Dominique shared the one from Minnesota, but this is one, it's not updated because they're not updating this anymore. So I accessed this in 2017, but it shows you the purple is where Japanese beetle is established by consensus. So again, that's from 2017. They are moving westward. Um, there's no doubt about that. The other states in green, they have never been found. That means that there's a lot of monitoring that happens in those states. Um, I saw a talk one time in uh, Oregon or Washington, I forgot. They have traps at all major airports for Japanese beetle so that they can eradicate them as soon as they start coming in that way. So uh, the westward expansion is still happening. And actually I didn't share that data, but on our study with, um, with Japanese beetle and vineyards, um, we, had, we looked at the impact of the uh, uh, cropland around the vineyards to see if we could explain uh, the infestation levels, um, especially with that um, edge effect that we see. We didn't really see that. We saw it one year, we didn't see it the other year, but the main um, factor that we saw affecting Japanese beetle infestation in vineyards was the, uh, so now I won't remember, the longitude. So the further west you go, the less Japanese beetle we had. So it's still something that we see. For an insect that was introduced in 1916, uh, or detected, that's unbelievable that we're still seeing that kind of movement. And it's such a strong flyer. It's really interesting. Um, but I just wanted to share that quickly. There's a question that we had to skip uh, after Dominique's presentation. It was about the traps that you use. What kind of trap are you using with the exclusion net? Is it a commercial trap or do you make your own? 
Uh, we use a commercial trap that we order. I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm not muted. Uh, that we get from Great Lakes IPM. And specifically, we use, now we use Sentry. I think during the time of that study, though, they use Trace A, SWD traps. And the only difference between those is the components of the lure are slightly different. And then also the liquid base that's used. Trace A is apple cider vinegar, where Sentry is just water. But yeah, we Great Lakes IPM is where we get our commercial traps from. I can put that in the chat if that helps. I think that in the end, just so people know, when we talk about traps, the commercial traps is really what people are using for research. Mm -hmm. Homeowners should just use a basic yeast and sugar and water trap and some salt in it and a potato salad container that's 32 ounce and put the holes because that's so much cheaper. And in the end, the traps are only used to monitor the first occurrence. And once you have them, you don't need to have the traps really that much unless you're really trying to be on top of how much your insecticide program is working and you want to reassess when to reapply. But if you're not doing that, if you're not really on top of your monitoring, just monitoring for the first fly appearing and somebody asks, how long should you spray insecticide um, for? Once you're done with harvest, that's when you can stop. So the traps is really not, besides telling you when they first show up in your crop, they're not really useful unless you're on an active program, management program, and you're applying insecticide and you wanna know when to reapply. But overall, people don't really use them. One thing I don't know if I missed it, um, Dominique, but one thing that's really important to take into account is prompt harvest, especially if you're working in organic. Did you mention that? I mentioned it in sanitation. Just yeah. kind of, yeah, as soon as it becomes like to ripe a little bit as soon as possible. But yeah, I didn't reference it specifically like that. Yeah, harvest every other day if you can. That's the best thing you can do, especially in organic production. Keep on top of that, and that will really help minimize those populations. And then refrigerate your fruit. When you're bringing them home, when you're selling them, tell people to refrigerate their fruit. That will slow or stop the development of those immatures in there. Another question came through on the Q&A window is, um, how do spotted wing Drosophila overwinter? We talked about that is on too so we have so many people who can uh, answer this complicated question yeah we kind of we briefly talked about that and how it is understood the adults do stay here in the winter and they find some form of shelter it's just not there's not a lot of evidence or anything that really shows distinct proof of finding these adults overwintering we just we know that they are overwintering in probably a sheltered area as an adult yeah. Still, that's still a, that's a complicated one that I think a lot of people are still trying to work on. And so there's also the possibility that there's a migration. Some people talk about that. And we don't really know. It could be a combination of both. We know that if they are overwintering, they do overwinter as adults. Mm -hmm. We suspect that they're overwintering in the Midwest and in the Northeast and all those areas where it's really cold because there's a winter morph. So there is a morph of the flies that can sustain those cold temperatures for long periods of time. But we have in the Midwest, no evidence of where they are in the winter. We don't know. We haven't been able to ever catch them in the winter so far. But we're, we're looking hard at that, Michigan State and other states. So, so there's a question, oh, from Bill Hutchison. Mm -hmm. Bill? <laughs> So. <laughs> the question is, for Japanese beetle, have you looked at increases in trap catch around any of the berry crops relative to when or how soon the Japanese, be Japanese beetle and crops start increasing? We, I, yeah, I don't know if we've answered, if we asked that question exact, no, not really. We just looked at the population um, in vineyards. That's all we've done so far. Um, relative to when or how soon the Japanese beetle numbers increase in the crop start to increase? No, we haven't really asked that question. I'm not sure I understand fully the question, but um, we've just looked at 
what their what the population does in the in the vineyards and then we looked at the different factors that could be impacting those population levels but we can talk more about that another time any or oh, there's something more in the q a or no no i think that oh. Is there a correlation between trap catch and Japanese beetle numbers on the plants? Between trap catch and on the plants? We don't have trap catches. We don't, none of our work that I presented was with trap because the traps are actually attracting beetles. So if we really want to see what the population is in a, a crop, you can't use traps. So we did a hand sampling. We went and collected all the Japanese beetle on the number of vines, I forgot if we're doing three vines in all those different areas. I think that's what we're doing. Um, but it's, we never looked at that because the trap catches, um, you will attract, so there might be a correlation, but only because you're attracting more beetles. But then what's the correlation between trap catches and number of adults on the trap? I don't know if there's a correlation, but I would not recommend putting a trap anyways. So I don't know that there's a point in putting the trap per se. You'll increase the number that are going to be feeding around your trap, likely. Dominique, do you have anything to say about that? No, I, I, I definitely agree. If you have a trap near a crop, the trap is bringing them in, it's kind of confounding any results you would see. And it's either pulling them away from the crop into the more attractive lure, or it's bringing them from elsewhere and increasing plot like the surrounding populations. Um. So another question, how about setting up Japanese beetles, tr Japanese beetle traps far away from your berry fields to attract them away from the field actually as a management strategy? So in your neighbor's yard, is that? <laughs> we don't recommend that. <laughs> so one of the neighbors in my neighborhood on one of those blogs that everybody puts on was saying, if we do pretty much what they were saying without the term is area wide trapping that could potentially work but nobody has ever tried that really those traps what they do is they attract them near the trap and in the trap but the near the trap are the big problem so you're bringing them closer to your crop um, than you would if you didn't have a trap so no we would not recommend that and also the trap pretty quick so if you're not and so if you have this trap with this idea that it's somehow going to pull them away once that trap fills up if you're not emptying it frequently enough this it, there's potential spillover on your crop because there's no interest in the trap anymore so aren't there researchers at maybe missouri who are trying to use giant like trash can sized traps to address that issue yeah yeah, they caught like over a million beetles in one season or something like that. What did you say? They caught, I think it was at least, a, it was over a million beetles in one season they caught in the trash can traps. That's what, that's what I call them. Yeah, yeah. that's gross. So, um, do we know how, like, how that research is going? I don't know. I think that was published, but I don't know. I think the big question is, okay, if you had a lot of beetles in the trap, would you be able to decrease the defoliation you have in your crop, right? And that's the problem, is we don't know if you could actually decrease it or if you're actually increasing it. So what we think from no research, from just seeing that when you have a trap, you tend to increase the defoliation that you have around that trap. But from a standpoint of having... Um, a lot of traps, a kind of mass trapping type thing. Could you decrease, if you did that away from the crop, could you decrease defoliation? And that, I, I don't know if anybody has done that. Um, so, uh, One kind of, while learning how to be a researcher, something we did last year was we set up about 27 JB traps around a raspberry crop. And it was looking at do various aspects of the traps to kind of see what they're doing. And we actually trapped out over 700,000 beetles that season with all those traps, like adding up our trap catches. And this year we did notice a decrease in our grub samples compared to, we're not sure if it's directly related to traps, but there is, there's a potential there that the mass trapping, at least in that specific area, minimized the grubs coming out of that season. And at the end of this season, we'll try to see 
if maybe our trap catches this year in the area of a lower population compared to we moved our phenology to a different area because of the impact but yeah we did it was a mistake that actually had a, a pretty cool turnout for research so nice interesting so um, one thing, I, a product that I don't think was mentioned that a couple organic growers have asked me about is Beetle Gone. Does anybody have data or experience with that product? There's data out there. People have tried it. I don't, I haven't seen the data per se. It's somewhat effective, but it wasn't, um, it would be considered probably in the good area. Well, no, actually I've seen some data, right, right, right. I've seen it in vineyards. Um, and it was, I think actually it was similar to the control in that one study. So it wasn't um, great. So I would no. suspect that it's like, if you go over a lot of different trials in different crops, that it's marginally okay. The kale in clay in that study in, um, in vineyards did much better than the, um, than the, B, the BT, the um, beetle gun. The bacillus, bacillus thuringiensis. All right. Well, I'm impressed with everybody for staying on um, past two here. We still have 28 people hanging out. Um, so I hope that means the conversation is valuable to everyone. Um, we should probably log off though and <laughs> It seems like in our area, the rain's stopping, so maybe it's time to go back outside. <laughs> um, Super sunny here. Oh, good. <laughs> so thanks everybody for, um, for coming. Thank you to Christelle and to Dominique for um, taking part in this webinar today. This is, we've done a lot of different webinars and podcast episodes this season, and I'm sure everyone has gotten a lot of experience learning Zoom. Um, so this is our last one for a while, and sooner than later it'll be the conference season and then we'll see everyone again i'm sure and thank you very much annie for organizing all of these and speaking at so many of these events that's been, been great working with you all summer so thank you so much you. all right so we will email out the recording and the pdfs of these presentations in a couple of days got to, i gotta put out a couple more fires before i get to that but soon thank all you right. thank okay. you everybody bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.